let's get started. There's something, there's always something really scary when you stand between a bunch of people and their lunch. That's whew, something primal about it. Uh, welcome to my talk, Leading Tech Teams in Uncertain Times. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take all of you on a little bit of a journey, both of our industry, but also of the past year. So as you might understand, that's not really going to be the feel good talk all of you might be hoping for. But I will try to make it really interesting and worthwhile for you. You will learn how the landscape of our industry has changed over the last few years. And you'll also learn how we as leaders need to adapt to that change in order to continuously deliver uh, value. Uh, and I'll also give you five concrete things that you can actually take with you and implement for you and your team to stay on track even if nothing else is staying on track. So to begin with, how many here worked during the golden era of the dot-com bubble? All right, there are a few people. For the rest of you, I'm going to tell you a crazy story. So the dot-com bubble, it was kind of like a gold rush of our industry. Only instead of pickaxes, people had keyboards and unlimited amounts of caffeine. It was literally crazy. Everybody was launching companies left and right, and all the companies had dot-com in their name. And even if you weren't on the internet, you put dot-com in your name because that meant the valuation of your company would go up. So there was a bunch of brilliant ideas that came out of the dot-com bubble things like pets.com for ordering pet food online, and also boo.com, one of the first e-fashion retailers. Of course, of course, both of those failed because the timing was completely off. And the people not starting companies, they're putting money inside the companies that were being started. So there was a lot of capital. And the thing was, since there was so much money going around, nobody was really thinking about revenue. What people were counting was eyeballs, meaning how many people actually visited your site. So companies had more money than they kn knew what to do with. So obviously, they used the money for beach parties and crazy offices and helicopters and jet skis. This is true. It was crazy. And the way products were developed was basically in this just crazy manner without process. Things were going online. It was glorious until investors knocked on the door uh, early 2000 and were like, hey, um, the money we gave you, we were kind of hoping that, you know, that we would be able to get that back. So what's your plan for making revenue? And that's when it all burst like an overinflated balloon and just went pop. And with this came the stop of the fun days. And the counter reaction was that the next thing we were talking about in our industry was business plans, profits, ROIs, estimates, roadmaps. And that's the situation we've been in for the last 20 years. My name is Martin Masur, and I'm the Chief Product and Technology Officer at uh, Trenton 37. We're a software consultancy that helps our clients build their digital teams. For the last six or seven years, what I've been doing is I've been coaching and mentoring technical leaders to become better uh, at working with people and better at setting up their teams. I was actually not part of the dot-com dot bubble. I started working in 2003. So I usually say I was part of the cleanup crew because I'm the person that came in after all the fun stuff was done, trying to figure out how to make a lot of things profitable. Uh, I started working as a software developer, uh, C++. And so when I started working, we had all of these things. We did have the roadmaps and plans and Gantt charts and budgets and specifications. One of the first jobs I had, we literally had I'm not kidding you, this thick binder, paper binder on our desk, uh, on our desk with uh, the specification for the software we were building. And the thing is, it kind of worked back then. Kind of worked 20 years ago. And the reason it did is because we were moving slow. So I'm guessing a lot of you know what this is. is does anybody not know what this is? 
great, I'm happy. It's a CD-ROM. And this is how we shipped the software I was working on. It shipped on CD-ROMs, which means that when we were done coding and testing and doing all the things, we sent the stuff over to a factory that pressed the CD-ROMs. And when the CD-ROMs were pressed, they were packaged in boxes and shrink-wrapped and sent to customers. So obviously, our releases were really slow. And this is why all the planning and Gantt charts and roadmaps kind of worked, because we shipped like once a year. And when we shipped, the software needed to be pristine, because no software developer wanted to be responsible for a day one patch event, which meant that when the customer got their box with the nice software, it also got a little note saying, by the way, you need to go to this web address and you need to download this little patch and you need to install it in order for your software to work. Nobody wanted to do that. So we had code freezes and we shipped things off to QA and QA went over everything meticulously. And then, you know, the software was perfect. Since then, a lot of things have changed. One thing that's changed is our context has expanded. We don't ship software where we ship software, and we are effect, much more affected by world events than we used to be. And customers demand quicker updates. Uh, customers demand newer features, and they demand things as they happen. So really, we can't do it the way we used to do it. And just to illustrate how crazy the world is, let's look at this past year. So let's just look at the things that happened. So we started January with a lot of economic uncertainty. We had inflation and um, we had inflation and a you know, dawning recession and everything went crazy. And then of course, Twitter didn't stop being crazy because Elon continued to make it crazy. And of course, the Ukraine, uh, the Russia's war on Ukraine dragged on as by in February, that was one year. And then Turkey Syria earthquake hit with a lot of casualties. After that, AI enters the chat, GPT-4 comes out, and uh, when we think everything is going to be fine, Silicon Valley bank collapses, sending ripples throughout the whole industry. Then came April. April was great because nothing really bad happened in April. But then in May, First Republic Bank fails, which was actually a bigger deal than Silicon Valley Bank failure, uh, creating even more economic distress. Then we move into summer. Summer means warm, means that Greece, Hawaii, Canada, and a lot of other places had wildfires. This is a big problem. And then, of course, as uh, since everything was heating up, oceans hit a new world record uh, for, um, for temperature. And we're not done with natural disasters because then the Morocco earthquake hit. And after that, the European Central Bank said, I think you're all having a too good time. So let's just hike interest rates up to a new record. At this point in time, we were all kind of done with 2023. And of course, uh, Hamas decides to uh, attack Israel. Uh, and we launch into conflict in Gaza, creating a lot of casualties, uh, civilian casualties on both the Israeli and Palestinian side. And we still have one and a half months to go of this year. Please stop. Uh, but the thing is, what I'm trying to illustrate is if you're running roadmaps for your project, did you think of any of this? Did you put any of these events on your roadmap? No. So people don't. And the problem with this is that these events actually do affect us. They affect us as people. They affect the teams we work in. And sometimes they even affect the products we work on. And we need to be able to respond to those things. Yet, you know, we have this roadmap, so we need to follow the plan. But I'm going to save you. In 2024, is going to be different for you. Because what I did is I went online and I downloaded all the reports from the cool companies, from the Gartners, the Forbes, the Radar Groups, and all of them. And no, I didn't read them. Like, I, I have better things to do. I put them into AI. And then I asked the AI, well, what do you think of these reports? So what do we need to think about in 2024? Please don't try to read this. But AI came up with some cool things, like AI is a partner, and be safe, and uh, protect the future, so on and so forth. Honestly, it really doesn't matter. 
None of this is on your roadmap, and even if it was, it won't save you. So what, I, what I'm trying to get to is that we need to build teams that are uh, geared for preparedness over planning. Because the reason we end up in these chaotic situations is because we continuously miss the mark of what we're trying to do with our products. Because we sit down, we formulate a plan, and as we're delivering the plan, the next global disruption hits us. And then the next one, and then the next one. So we never end up in the right destination at the right time. We're just moving too slow. And this is because the organizations we've built over the last 20 years since the dot-com bubble are all built around planning and following plans and uh, following roadmaps. But in today's ever-changing environment, what we instead need to do is we need to create teams of diverse people that are geared towards solving problems, not factories of knowledge workers that are built to deliver features. So what, is, what do we do when uncertainty hits? Do we rise up like a superhero and go like, let's face this uncertainty and fix everything? No, we don't. What we actually do is we cower and we retract and we go into a conference room and say like, oh, let's plan. Let's plan for this uncertainty. That's going to save us. So let's, let me take you back to my CD-ROM days of working on software. So at this company, we're working in this piece of software, and not everything was always fine. At one point in time, we actually had a problem, and the problem was because we had such a meticulous plan. What happens is... Uh, when you have a release that needs to go to pressing, when you need to press the CD-ROM, that needs to ship out a certain date. If you find a critical bug, well, let's say a disastrous memory leak, then the whole time schedule is jeopardized. And it's not only the factory waiting to press the CDs, it's also all the launch events and all the conferences and all the uh, things that the salespeople have booked. So at this point in time, it's total chaos and we have one week to get this done and nobody knows how to solve the problem. So what did we do? Or rather, what did our project manager do? Because at this point in time, we had a project manager. Well, she took us all into a room and she started, no, she didn't start planning, come on. That would, that would be a fun talk. She gathered a small subset of the team and took us into a room and looked us all very seriously in the eyes and asked us one question. What do you need to get this done? And we looked at each other and we said, hey, you know what? Some pizza would be really nice. It's true, we did say pizza, but we also said a couple of other things. We said, you need to get us one big room. We need to move all our computers into the big room from our separate offices. Uh, you need to get us pizza. You need to get us some whiteboards. And you need to get us access to the building at all hours of the day. Lots of coffee, caffeine. And we worked on this problem and eventually we did get it solved in time and we basically just went home to sleep. Uh, and the whole situation was filled with uncertainty, volatility, complexity, and ambiguity. Because we're not only dealing with uncertainty when we're talking about it, we're actually dealing with all of these four parameters. So volatility is when things change quickly. When we talk about a volatile market, it's a market that shifts quickly, a volatile element. It shifts from fluid to solid to gas uh, quickly. The way she worked with this was she set a direction. She told us, this is what I need to get done. And then she waited for us to volunteer for the task. Uncertainty is when you don't know what you're supposed to do. And what she did was she provided us with enough context, with the time schedule, with the consequences. This is what's going to happen if we don't get this done in time in order for us to be able to figure out the right solution to the problem. And complexity means there's many parameters. It was a very complex piece of software with a lot of moving parts written in C++. Uh, and... What she did is she put up constraints saying, I know there's a lot of moving things, but this one issue is what we need to look on right now. 
So we need, so we knew what problem we were focusing in on. And then the ambiguity, that's when there's no clear right or wrong, no up or down. You don't really know where to go. What she did was she handpicked the people that she took into that conference room in order to create enough perspectives for us to be able to view the problem from all different sides. So we had designers, front end developers, back end developers, QA, no everything that we needed inside of that team. This model is called VUCA. It was created by the military after the Cold War in order to describe the geopolitical situation uh, that was in the world, a situation with no specific enemy. Since then, it's a model that's been popular not only inside of the military, but also inside of business and leadership to describe these types of volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous situations. This is the world we're living in right now. So what do we need? to lead in 2023 and beyond. The so first thing I'm going to address is uncertainty uh, because this talk is actually called leading in uncertain times. So in order to address uncertainty, what I believe we need to do is we need to lead with context. So what does lead with context mean? Let me tell you a story about Mahatma Gandhi. In the 1930s in India, there was a salt monopoly by the British rule, meaning nobody else was allowed to produce salt other than the ruling, uh, than, than the government, the, other than the government. Mahatma Gandhi thought that this was one of the great injustices among many in India at the time and decided that he would stage a peaceful protest in order to break the salt monopoly. He left his uh, living area with a few dozen of his followers and went on an almost 400 km kilometer long march to the ocean, stopping at every city, every town on the way, telling people, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. And if you like, you could join me. And people did. As he reached the ocean, he did the one illegal act, the actual thing that was outlawed. He took seawater and evaporated it into salt. After that, he continued to move into the next town, evaporating uh, seawater into salt, and the next, time, next town evaporating seawater into salt, until he finally got arrested. Over the upcoming months, his actions gathered more than 60,000 followers, creating such pressure that eventually the government had to renegotiate the monopoly and, set, uh, and release Gandhi out of prison. He led with context because he did three things. He says, this is where I'm going. Uh, he said, this is where I'm going. Uh, and, uh, sorry. He, he said, uh, he, so he led with context because number one, he painted a picture of where he was going. So this is where I'm going. Uh, number two, he went first. He went on the march himself. And number three, he created or facilitated a voluntary movement of people in that direction. He didn't force anyone to go with him. So inside of your organization, leading with context means providing enough information for everybody to know what's going on and why we're doing the things we're doing. So the first thing you need is to be very clear and evangelize the company mission. Why is this organization put on this planet? What are, are we trying to achieve? Second thing is the product vision. A product vision is different from a roadmap because it's a dream of what the product could look like and how it could benefit the user or the customer. And with the product vision, you also want a set of principles and the principles are things that help teams make choices. For instance, a product principle could be if profit and ethics uh, stand, in, uh, uh, stand against each other, we will always prioritize ethics as a company. Or it could be technical principles, like if we have a technological choice between technologies that look like this and this, we're always going to pick this type of technology. Or other things, basically some principles that help people make choices where they are, so they don't have to go and ask, what choice do I need to make? And then you need a product strategy, and the product strategy 
is basically how do we think we're going to get to the vision? What are the, the things that we think we need to do? And then you have the teams working. And the teams working should ultimately be given customer problems or business problems to solve, not features to build. Then the teams should themselves be able to figure out what the best solution to that is. So this is what leading with context looks like. It means providing enough information for everybody to know what we're doing, going first, and then facilitating the voluntary movement of those people in that direction. Next one we're looking into is the volatility. And the way to deal with volatility, volatility is to enable discovery. And enabling dis is to enable discovery. Because in a volatile times, we need to find new ways of solving problems and we need to be able to find them quickly. And one way of thinking about this is Here's Benny Anderson of ABBA fame. He's also done a bunch of musicals and other things and generally considered a creative person. And when he was asked, like, so what do you do? Like, what's your creative thing? Benny just went and said, like, well, listen, I produce about 20 hours of music per year, and some of it is good. But the way I do it is I sit in the studio every day and I play around and create things and do stuff. So basically what he's saying is he spends his full working year on discovery to produce 20 hours of product. Now, I'm not saying you should do the same thing, but I'm saying you should at least do some discovery in your teams. So what do I mean by discovery? So I've stolen this image from Hendrik Neibar. Uh, which, he usually, uh, which he usually shows in order to say, you know, this is the Agile model the way it was thought about, and this is uh, illustrate stuff. But I actually think that it's wrong, because I think we need to do both things here, and we need to be able to run them in parallel. So when the reason I'm saying this is because if you run your iterations like the image on top, what happens after iteration one? You have a very unhappy customer. This, that man or that yellow person is sad. And they're not really that happy until they get the motorbike, which is by iteration four. And by that time, they left for a competitor. So doing discovery inside of iterations not only doesn't work, it's also too slow. So we need to be able to run discovery much quicker. And then once we figure it out that what the customer actually wants is the car, we need to go down and build that properly because sometimes there are architectural layers, there's things that, that need to go in a certain order, which means we can kind of just build the software as we go along, unless we want to end up with a lot of technical debt. These two things are done by the same team in parallel all the time, but if we run discovery as discovery, we can iterate much quicker and figure out much quicker where we need to be, and then we can build it properly, the way uh, we want to build with the architecture needed. Because anybody that's built a complex piece of software knows that if you know what you're building, it's much easier to figure out what the correct architecture for that thing is going to be, instead of discovering what the architecture is as you move along. All right. Next thing, complexity. So, when dealing with complexity, the easiest thing to do or the thing you should be doing is to find relevant simplifications. Make things simpler in order to be able to solve them, which means working with constraints. So either natural constraints, which already exist, or you can impose constraints in order to be able to solve a smaller or a subset of the problem. This here is Mick Jagger. So, Mick Jagger uh, is the king of working with constraints because he has a very specific dance style, which was then popularized by TikTok and the song Moves Like Jagger. But the reason Moves Like Jagger exists is because when the Rolling Stones were touring in the early days, they were playing really small clubs. 
maybe a stage like this. And after they were setting up all the speakers and guitars and drums and everything, Mick only had about a square meter to stand on like this. And he could have stood there and just sung his songs like most people did in the small clubs, but Mick is a showman and he decided that he wanted to put on a show for the people. So he figured out a way to do a show in one, one square meter. And that became his signature move. If the Rolling Stones would have had an infinite stage, that dance style would have never, never been, never been uh, invented. And we wouldn't have the TikTok trend. But there's other things as well that, you know, where constraints help. Zappos was always wanted to sell shoes online, but at the point in time when Zappos wanted to do this, nobody wanted to buy shoes online. And the reason people didn't want to buy shoes online because they were afraid of what's going to happen if they don't fit or what's going to happen, uh, you know, when there's a problem with it. So what Zappos did was they pioneered free returns and kick-ass customer service. And this actually enabled them to sell shoes online and opened up for a whole new business of selling fashion online that didn't exist before. Similarly, Southwest Airlines also at one point in time fell into bad, bad times and lost one of their airplanes or had to sell one of their airplanes. What happens when you sell one of your airplanes, that's not an issue in the flight industry. What is if you lose one of your flight routes? If you lose one of your flight routes, that's a huge economic disadvantage. So Southwest Airlines figured out, you know, we could keep all of our flight routes if we can figure out 10 minute turnaround times. And they did. And that actually opened up for a whole industry of, um, a whole industry of low fare flights to be created, which wouldn't have existed otherwise. So in some cases, you're gonna have natural constraints when you deal with complexity. In other cases, like the one I was talking about with, uh, with the project manager, you can actually induce constraints. You can actually create constraints like, this is the way we're going to work on. We're going to work on it, but we're not allowed to spend more money than this. We're gonna work on it, but we can only use these people. Or we're gonna work on it, and we can only use this type of technology, or we're only going to do these changes. Because if you have unlimited playing field, the task becomes daunting. So constraints are your friend. Last one in the VUCA matrix is ambiguity. And the way to do ambiguity is to embrace difference. Now, I'm gonna ask for some audience participation. Next slide, there's going to be an image. And I want you to remember what the first thing is you see on the image, right? The first thing that you see when I pop up the image, please just remember that. Ready? One, two, three, go. How many saw a rabbit first? How many saw a duck? How many see both? No. Okay, if you look around you and you see somebody, oh, keep your hands up. If you look around you and you see somebody not with their hands up, help them see both the rabbit and the duck. All right. Let's do it again. This is gonna be, this is fun. Let's do it again. This time, this time, I just want you to shout out what you see. All right? Just first person to see something, just shout it out. One, two, three, go. What is it? What did you say? Bomb. Bomb. Red. Microcontroller. All right. Uh, this is actually an alarm clock. This is an alarm clock that was built by a 14-year-old kid called Ahmed Muhammad in 2015. He built it over a week and he thought it was really cool, so he wanted to take it to school and show it to his engineering professor. So he did, and his engineering teacher thought it was really cool and said, yeah, Ahmed, this is a really cool uh, clock, but you should put it in your backpack and not show it to anybody else, because bomb. But of course, Ahmed was really proud of what he'd done, so he took it out in English class and the alarm went off. His English teacher did not have knowledge inside of engineering. So the police were called and Ahmed was arrested and suspended from school for three days. This is what ambiguity looks like. Because given how you interpret information and your background and what you know, you're going to see things differently. 
So the way to deal with ambiguity is to create teams with a culture ad, meaning you're putting the people on your team that uh, the, uh, you're putting people on your team that have different gender, education, cultural background, socioeconomic background in order to be able to see as many perspectives as possible. This way, you're going to create teams that are better, better uh, built to handle these types of ambiguities. So when you're faced with a problem, you can actually discuss what is it we're seeing here. What is this thing? Uh, and then if you have a very, uh, very homogenous teams, there are some things you're just not going to be able to achieve. So who knows uh, who this is? This is Esther Blenda Nordstrom. So she, is, is she, is she was a, a journalist in the 1900s, one of the few female reporters uh, in Sweden, real rarity at the time. In 1914, what Blenda did was she embarked on this daring uh, undercover assignment, uh, undercover assignment, uh, posing as a maid in order to expose the harsh working conditions and mistreatments of domestic workers in Sweden. This resulted in a very influential book called A Maid Among Maids. Uh, and she was also a pioneer of the pioneer of the working method of journalists going undercover in order to discover stories from the inside. A method that in the 1970s was named after a German man, because that's how stories go. So Nordstrom's reporting also uncovered topics like uh, covered topics like education, healthcare, social issues. Uh, and contributed to a lot of awareness for women's rights and social injustices in Sweden. These are things that could have only been done by Esther Blenda Nordstrom or another woman at the time. This would not have been possible for anybody else. And the last thing I'm going to cover is starting again, because this doesn't speak to any specific area of VUCA, it speaks to all of the areas. Because when we deal with uncertainty, volatility, ambiguity, and complexity, what's going to happen is we're going to fail. We're going to fail a lot. So being able to start again, start anew, the theme for this conference, reboot, or you know, some call it resilience, that is key. And the queen of resilience is Taylor Swift. Regardless if you like or don't like Taylor's music, she is a powerhouse, a skilled artist and a businesswoman that's achieved tremendous things throughout her career. When she was 14 years old, she was, uh, she was turned down by record label after record label after record label because of you're too young or the music is the wrong style or this. So what she did is she convinced her family to move to Nashville She's 14 year old, convinced her family to move to Nashville in order to further her music career. Because in Nashville, there people would be more, uh, more open to the music style she was playing at the time. And after that, her career has suffered beat down after beat down, yet she's managed to start again every time and find a new creative solution to the problem. Most recently, I don't know if you've, you know, you're familiar with this, but she was trying to buy back all of her old records, the masters and the back catalog of all of her music. And when that failed, what she figured out was like, screw it, if I can't buy it back, I'm just gonna re-record all my old music again and release it again, because now I'm going to own the masters, I'm going to own the music, because they can't stop her from doing that. With that, she joined Dolly Parton as the only other artist to have uh, both the original and the re-recording hit, uh, hit uh, charts. So this is creativity. This is bouncing back. This is starting again. And what is it Taylor knows that the rest of us don't? Well. Actually, I don't really think it's anything specific. I just think that a lot of us have been brainwashed not to be creative uh, problem solvers. 
This is a study created in 1968 by George, uh, George Land and Beth Jarman. Uh, they conducted a research study by, create, uh, by measuring creativity in children. They used the NASA's uh, test for creativity, which NASA uses to select innovative engineers and scientists. Uh, and this test specifically looks at how creative you are when it comes to coming up with new, and new solutions to problems. So when they measured uh, children three to five years old, 98% of them scored at genius levels in this test. Then you took the same children five years later and conducted the study again, and it was down to 30%. Five years after that, 12. And then it took a bunch of 31-year-olds and they gave them the test. Can anybody guess what the number for the 31 years old oldest was? Yeah, exactly, 2%. So what's happening here is not that we lose the knack for creativity. It's basically that we're taught not to be creative problem solvers. Because the way the whole school system and everything is rigged against us is not that the answer matters. It's not solving the problem that matters. It's how you solve the problem that matters. It's how you solve the problem that matters. It's not that you get the right math answer. It's show me the work, how you got there. And if you didn't get there the way I wanted you to get there, I'm still going to fail you. You write your thesis, but you write in this specific structure. Here's the reading list. Here are the books. So when we're done or when the school system is done with us, we basically always think that there is a best practice. There is a best solution to every problem. So when we're faced with a new problem, instead to think for ourselves and try to figure out how, how, you know, how can I solve this, we go looking. What's the best way of solving it? Who's the expert in the industry? Somebody's already done this before. And this is how creativity dies. Yay. Yay. Come on. Yay, security. So to summarize, Basically, when dealing with uncertainty, we want to lead with context. When we talk about volatility, we want to enable discovery. Complexity, we need to work with constraints either naturally or imposed. Ambiguity, we should embrace difference. And for all of it, we should be able to start again when we fail because we will fail and we're going to fail often. And before I let you all off the hook to go eat lunch, this is my parting slide. When we deal with VUCA situations, it's basically just a game of Tetris. And in a game of Tetris, if you focus too much on the bricks that are already laying, you're going to fail. And you focus too much on the bricks that you know, are in the future, you're going to fail. The only thing you can really deal with is the brick coming right, right at you. So taking that brick and, pay, and placing it in the correct position is always the right play. And the thing is, if you don't play, if you don't take the brick and you don't place it, inaction is also an action, then the bricks are just going to stack on top of each other. And we all know what happens in Tetris when the bricks stack up, uh, up on each other. You lose. So with that said, um, what are your questions? Are you all really hungry? Thank you for the talk. Very inspiring. Welcome. missing some kind of part in kind of feedback loop or learning of because you do all these things but given that you have set up the, the context of you're in a book situation all the time kind of yes so in terms of how do you how do you evaluate what you did frequently how do you learn from it I mean of course there's a lot of missing from this talk it's a 40 minute talk <laughs> I've been recovering but no, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of retrospectives. Like, I, I, uh, this is like, uh, if there's one practice I implement everywhere, it's the retrospective. And I, and I think Diana did a brilliant talk yesterday about, you know, the format of how retrospectives can look and what a retrospective is. And that the cadence of a retrospective doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, at the end of iteration, you can do retrospectives over lunch or morning retrospectives. Uh, and I think uh, this is some of the things we need to think about that, you know, figuring out better ways of doing things and, and building those feedbacks loop 
loops into the systems, the way that they work for us and or our organizations uh, is essential. Uh, I hope that was a okay answer. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and, and, and what is your views on uh, remote work versus things and uh, that situation and what you think? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so in general, I think uh, what should come first is the work. And then the way we work should come second. So what I mean by that is that you have to look at the context of what are we trying to solve, how's the work, work going to look, and then you can see if is this work that is could be done remotely or is this work that would benefit from us being co-located. And if it's work that would benefit from us being co-located, we should definitely co-locate. And today there's no, no clear answer, and I think that teams sometimes need to be co-located and sometimes can be distributed. For instance, I've been trying to run creative work, uh, ideations uh, remotely. It really doesn't work out in most situations. And the same thing, I think, when there's a crisis and communication is key, I think co-location is, is really important as well. So, I, you know, it's, it, the, the classical consultant answer is it depends. But I think both things have value, but we can't say that this one is better than the other. They're just better for different types of situations. All right. I'll stick around during lunch. And uh, so if anybody wants to grab me, please do. Uh, you can find all my contact details, uh, social media, things like that on the QR code. Uh, reach out if you want to. I'll be happy to book a one-on-one -on -one with anyone that wants to talk. Thank you so much.